um, applications. What really caused this change, right? In the last few, really risen in terms of um, popularity, you know, a little bit of hype, success. And I think there are a couple of reasons behind this. So first, um, you know, we have access to these state-of-the-art deep learning models um, for different use cases. And more important than their really good performance is the fact that they're really easily accessible. You have these open source libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, from which you can, you know, just write a few lines of code and get access to uh, the best performing model for your use case within within a blocked on not owning the best GPU or not having you know a, a giant kind of um, set of machines in in your company or uh, at your house you can take advantage of all these cloud providers um, to, to pay those uh, uh, you can get access again to the latest the one thing though that kind of hasn't reached that type of excellence is training data. And training data is critical to um, getting any machine learning pipeline and any machine learning application started. So you might have access to the best model, you might have access to the best hardware, but if you don't have the data for your particular use case, you're going to be blocked at that very first step. So what we realized, you know, kind of digging into this area a little bit more is engineering, engineers are kind of spending a lot of their time on just shaping their training data. And this includes, you know, labeling, it includes augmenting, it includes, you know, re-weighting re different samples, doing error analysis, sometimes going back and um, relabeling parts of the data because maybe they had incorrect ground root labels. But the main idea here is every kind of aspect associated with training data right now is fairly manual and tedious. And this is the problem that we wanted to solve. So the key idea behind Snorkel is to use noisy sources of signal at higher levels of abstraction to rapidly generate labels for your training data. I know I mentioned a lot of the other blockers in my previous slide as well. And if we have time towards the end, happy to talk through those too. But for the purpose of this talk, I'll just focus on the labeling component. So what does programmatically labeling data mean, right? So to kind of explain that at a high level, let's get started with an example. So let's say what we want to do is create a machine learning pipeline uh, that can tell us whether emails are spam or not. Um, the first step, again, is we need a set of labeled emails um, where each email is tagged as being spam or not spam. So what you can imagine is when we have all these emails and we're labeling them by hand, we would look for some patterns and heuristics to label them, right? If, for example, I see an email that claims that someone is royalty and needs money, I'll say, oh, this is probably spam. If I see an email that has a lot of misspellings, um, then I'll say it's probably spam, right? But if I see an email that says it's from my mom or my grandmom, I'll say, no, this is a normal email. It shouldn't go to my spam folder. So essentially what we're doing at a high level, even our being on some patterns, some domain knowledge, or some external knowledge that we have, and using that to assign these labels. So what we do with programmatic supervision is really take advantage of that and try to make it more systematic. So instead of kind of having that rule in my head that if someone's asking for money in an email, it's probably spam, I can convert it into a heuristic. So um, I can say, okay, of any emails, you know, whenever it says the words need money or is asking for money, then it's a spam email. And I can apply it to all the emails that I have access to. Similarly, I can do the same with emails that are not spam, uh, which we're referring to as ham in this example. But we can say, hey, if it has words that are related to any family members, so grandmom, mom, brother, sister, you know, any, any nicknames that we have for our friends, um, then it's probably a normal email. So what we're essentially doing is kind of converting these um, 
common sense rules that we have in our head to these heuristics and applying it to all our data. And as you can see here, right, um, these rules aren't going to be perfect. You know, maybe uh, as you can see in the second example, the word need money actually appears in an email that's not spam. So this rule is going to be wrong there. But the idea here is that if you have enough of these rules and they're more accurate than not, Snorkel can actually model how noisy these rules are, learn um, you know, to denoise them and integrate them in a optimal manner to get training labels for your data. So I know I went through a lot uh, right now kind of explaining this idea of rules, you know, how they can be incorrect. But what I'll do is kind of step through each part of this process in the next few slides. Here, I just wanted to give you an idea of um, what programmatic supervision would look like for an example like this. So I'll go ahead and get into the details here. Um, so, you know, we have these heuristics, that's great, but in practice, um, how do we encode them? So what we do is um, these rules, which we refer to as labeling functions in the snorkel paradigm, we essentially can codify them in Python. What you'll see um, towards the end of this talk is with our commercial product, we um, also have a way to develop these rules without having to write any code and doing it just in the UI. But for the purpose of this talk, I'll just focus on the codified Python version. Um, so here, you know, you can codify your rule in any way. It doesn't just have to be a heuristic. It can use external knowledge bases. It can use a database. It can wrap existing simple models. So essentially anything that takes in data and assigns a label, even if it's noisy to it, can be um, codified as a labeling function. So going into kind of the individual steps of the snorkel pipeline. First, users write these labeling functions, which assign noisy labels to your training data. This is exactly the types of rules we saw with the email classification task. You know, they can look for specific words, they can look for patterns, they can look for bad grammar, misspelling, sentiment, really any signal that we can get from the data. The next thing we do is we actually model the noise in each of these labeling functions and uh, combine the labels from them in an optimal manner, manner to create uh, probabilistic training labels for our data. Again, the main component to keep in mind for step one and step two here is we're not using any ground truth data, right? All we've done so far is codified our, um, you know, kind of common sense that we have into these rules applied it to the data. So 100,000 emails, a million emails, you know, 10 million emails, doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't affect the amount of work we have to do. We just have to write our rules. And the kind of denoising process is automatic and doesn't use any ground truth labels. Again, we'll go into details for that part later. And finally, you know, once we have our labels for our training data from uh, step one and step two, we can go ahead and train a machine learning pipeline down the road. And this pipeline can, or this model can be anything, right? It can be, you know, the latest and greatest BERT model. It can be an LSTM. It can be logistic regression. Um, any model you would train with normal training data, you can train with this probabilistic training data. So I'll go ahead and kind of step through each of the individual steps of this pipeline now, starting with writing the labeling functions. So we saw this example of um, you know, writing labeling functions for our email. And let's see what we can do for you know, different types of tasks also. So let's say we're starting with um, you know, another text task, but we want to do something a little more complicated like um, identifying relationships. So this was actually a real task that we did. And what we wanted to do here was determine whether a particular chemical mentioned in a sentence in PubMed abstracts causes a particular disease or not. So what we did here was we wrote these labeling functions, um, which were regex based and just looked at kind of the text of these abstracts, you know, looking for words like, hey, if the word due to appears between the chemical name and the disease, then there is a causation. If the words not cause appear, then there's no causation. I mean, these are two really simple rules, but you can imagine um, that we can, you know, write some things that are more complex, rely on external knowledge bases to solve this problem as well. We can also transfer the same type of um, you know, idea of writing programmatic labeling functions to non-text domains like images, videos, time series data. 
So in this case, what we did was we wanted to determine whether there's a person riding a bike in a particular image. So to address that, what we did was first we um, ran an object detector, just an off the shelf model over our images. And then we wrote labeling functions over the output of that model. So what we did was we wrote uh, functions that kind of encoded common sense of what it looks like when a person is riding a bike. Um, you know, if the person is above the bike or not, if their shapes are similar, if the number of people and bikes are the same in an image, so on and so forth. Again, these are all just multiple examples of how users are able to encode their domain knowledge via these noisy heuristics. The second step, you know, once users have kind of worked on um, their labeling functions is actually to model and combine the outputs of these labeling functions to create the training labels that we're looking for. Like I mentioned before, this process doesn't require any ground truth data. So, you know, from developing your labeling functions to this step, you've actually not had to hand label any data. And that's kind of, again, the key of this snorkel pipeline. So what the algorithms here do, which um, you know, we've worked on for a couple of years at Stanford, um, is essentially look at the overlaps and conflicts between different labeling functions and use that to learn how accurate each rule is. At a high level, um, you know, the, the logic that this model is using is if you have multiple labeling functions, you know, some of them always tend to agree with each other, while there's one that kind of randomly disagrees with labeling functions um, across a bunch of data points. That one that's randomly disagreeing is probably not very accurate, while the rest of them are accurate. I'm simplifying this a lot. Um, so I would really encourage people to go and take a look at the papers um, to get more details on the algorithms here. Another thing we can do is, you know, just learn correlations of that exist between these different labeling functions. Um, again, we can do this algorithmically in a similar manner. You know, we don't want to kind of double count any rules that have been written that kind of look for the same thing. Like if we have a rule that looks for the word uh, cause and we have a word that looks for the word because, and if they, you know, they're just doing like a simple string search, um, there's going to be a little bit of overlap there just because of how the rules are made. And we want to account for that. So again, you know, won't go into details here, but if, if people are more interested in this area, happy to talk about it later. And um, I've kind of pointed to some papers here as well. Finally, once we have our training labels from this, list, what we can do is, you know, train any machine learning model down the line. One common question that we often get at this step is, why do we need to train another machine learning model, right? We have labels for our data, why not just stop now? That's the whole point of doing machine learning. We didn't have to hand label any data. We wrote these rules. We um, use the label model to get training labels for this data. So why not just stop here? So to answer that question, um, we'll go into kind of what it looks like a little bit visually when we're writing these rules and tra um, getting training labels. So when we write these rules, you know, we let's say we have these data points, um, we get some conflicting labels for some data points, we might not even get labels for certain data points in case of abstains. So what the label model can do is it can give you a sense of the training labels for data points, but only those that received at least one label from these labeling functions. So going back to our email example and the two rules that we had, right? We were talking about um, looking for the words need money and looking for words that are related to uh, my friends and family. Now, let's say I have an email that comes from LinkedIn, right? Now it doesn't say need money. It doesn't say whether it's from like a family friend or you know has any of the kind of relationships that I was looking for. So in that case, my rules will not assign any label to that particular email. And the label model has no way of kind of generalizing from those rules to assign a label. What does have the power to do that though is these machine learning models that we can now train with our training data. These models can easily generate 
generalize beyond the information knowledge of, of um, really the powerful you know, neural networks that are out there today. Um, you know, we can do transfer learning, pre-training, really take advantage of the whole um, wide array of work people have put into developing these really powerful ML models and use that to generalize. So that now if you, um, you know, want to predict whether a particular email is ham or spam, we can do that by um, passing that into this trained ML model. It has no relationship to, you know, whether a labeling function would have assigned it a label or not. So this idea behind generalization and taking a bit advantage of, um, you know, the larger set of features and the power of these ML models is why we always have to train an ML model and can't just stop um, with our heuristics. So Again, you know, our idea here was that training data wasn't easy to get, sorry, training data wasn't easy to get for a lot of applications. And that's the bottleneck we kind of wanted to focus on. One question that we often get and, you know, wanted to answer for ourselves is, have we really, uh, you know, kind of addressed this bottleneck here, right? The kind of work required to manually label training data you know, we don't want that work to be the same as it's required to write these rules. So we actually held a workshop to test this in a very quantitative researchers do. Um, so we had people kind of hand label data for a couple of hours on one day. And on the second day, we had people learn how to use snorkel and write labeling functions. And then we applied it to all the unlabeled data that was available. And what we saw was in the same amount of time, we were able to label almost 10 times more data because, you know, when you write four rules, again, you can apply it to 100 data points, 10,000 data points, a million data points without any extra work on, on the user side. And this is exactly what we did. So with our rules, we were able to get access to a much larger training set. And even though it was slightly more noisy than the one that was hand labeled, when we trained a machine learning model and evaluated it, the model trained on labels from Snorkel did almost you know, 25 points better than the one that was trained on hand label data, just because we had so much more training data available. And I think this touches on you know, a common theme that we've seen across a lot of applications where people are trying to use machine learning. Most of the time you have access to the data the problem is you don't have a clean set of labels or don't want to go through um, the process of hand labeling that data. Or you have data um, and you, know, you can just open it up to crowd workers because that data is private. So Snorkel really helps you kind of take advantage of this programmatic um, way, which is much more efficient than hand labeling data. If your data um, has any privacy concerns and you can't open up to crowd workers, this is another option you can do because, you know, Snorkel is an algorithm, you're writing your own rules, no one needs to see your data. And finally, one thing that I don't have on the slides, unfortunately, there's this idea that, you know, your training data can change. Um, there can be distribution shifts in your input data. There can be changes you make to your model. You know, maybe you were doing a binary task and now you realize you actually need to make it a five class problem. With all these changes, now instead of having to go back and manually relabel like a million data points, just a couple of these rules that you've written in Snorkel, reapply it, which again, no user effort required there, and then continue training your model and adapting. Um, so you know, out a couple of advantages here, but again, what we're focusing on here is we can rely on domain expertise and rules, use that to create training labels for a large amount of data, and then train machine learning models like we would with any training set. So I'll uh, pause here in case people have any questions because I was going to move on to a uh, sort of slightly um, kind of advanced uh, portion of a snorkel and just talk about kind of um, other things that we've been working on and trying to do to make this process of um, cre creating a training set much easier for people. So I'll pause for any questions and also take a look at the chat and Q&A.
All right, looks like there was nothing yet. Um, and again, I encourage people to ask kind of any questions, things that are not on slides, things that are unclear, anything, um, you know, even related that you would like to uh, learn about. So going through these kind of, you know, um, processes that we kept working on to make this uh, bottleneck of training data easier. So one project that we worked on was looking at how we could make this process of writing labeling functions even easier. So one thing, you know, as you noticed, was we were writing these labeling functions in Python, right? Um, and a lot of people that we were collaborating with, um, for example, at uh, the Stanford uh, hospitals, they weren't people who would be comfortable enough writing these rules like on. You know, they're domain experts, they're radiologists, they're people in science. Um, it's much easier to, you know, come up with an explanation instead of codifying it in Python. So what we did was we developed this method that can take uh, just natural language explanations just like I was describing the rules to you. Um, so you can type in, uh, yes, I think this chemical causes this disease because the word due to appears between um, the chemical and the disease name. Then we can use a semantic parser to automatically convert that into heuristics and then feed it into the rest of the snorkel pipeline like we would before. And what we saw here, again, is just this power of programmatic supervision. You know, 30 explanations was giving us the same quality for our model as collecting 600 hand-labeled examples. And you can see, you know, again, this can scale, right? If we had access to a much larger amount of unlabeled data, just 30 explanations could have created, you know, as much as a million labeled data points, which we can then use to train our machine learning model. We also worked on kind of um, ideas around generating these labeling functions automatically, especially for cases where um, the labeling functions were more dependent on a numerical thresholds. And in this case, um, what we saw was that we were able to create a method that kind of guessed at these numerical thresholds much faster than we would have been able to if we were kind of manually guessing and checking. I won't go into details here for image and uh, video types data. We were able to do, um, you know, a lot more didn't have to manually create labeling functions for um, each case we were looking at. You know, pointed to a couple of papers here to take a look. Example that worked on was related to um, looking at uh, deformities for um, hearts in MRI videos. Followed the same process, you know, had unlabeled MRI data, wrote labeling functions for it, trained a downstream machine learning model, um, and we were able to get significant improvements over training a model just with, um, you know, hand labeled data and also over other baselines as well that I can get into if people have questions around that. So what I want to kind of close out with, and then I see a couple of uh, questions coming here. So I'll, I'll pause for those and start answering them right after. Um, one thing that I wanted to kind of get into is at Snorkel AI, um, we are building Snorkel Flow, which is a platform uh, for enterprise AI. And what we're focusing on here is helping people build end-to-end -end AI applications um, where again, you know, Training data is part of the process of building ML pipelines, but we have four stages of going through this and really helping, you know, make this iterative process of building machine learning models a first class citizen of our platform. Um, there's more details on the AI website. Again, I'm happy to question, answer questions here as well. Is I'll stop here go through the questions we have um, on, on the, the talk. Uh, and I can ask if presentation will be available for webinar. I'll, lay, I'll let Bill answer that question. Um, I believe so. Yeah, I'm, I'm. So there's a question that says, uh, 
does the labeling process take a substantial amount of time or computational power, or is it something that's affordable to anyone? Um, that's a great question. So the label model is not a complex model, like a deep learning model. Um, and so it's not going to, you know, take you like hours and hours on a, a GPU. But again, that's dependent on how much data you have available. If you want to see details for the label model, again, you can take a look at the paper, which is uh, pointed to in these slides. We also have an open source version of this that you can take a look at as well. Um, and I encourage you to kind of um, look at that. And again, email me if you have more detailed questions or any tasks that you're thinking about in mind. Um, another question I see on the Q&A panel is, can we give an example? Uh, Sorry, I think it oh, right there. Um, can you give an example of the accuracy of the labeling process when compared to a data set that contains ground truth? That's actually a wonderful question. I think I actually have a slide for that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen again, find that slide and um, talk about that. Um, we, you know, when we were doing research, it's possible to compare the performance of snorkel to ground truth data when we have access to it, right? But in a lot of cases, especially in real world tasks, the reason we're using snorkel is because we don't have access to ground truth data for that training set. Um, but one of the things we've seen is, you know, with a couple of rules, we're able and access to a much larger amount of unlabeled data, we're actually able to um, get to within one point of training with uh, ground truth labels. So uh, apologies here, just pulling up two um, results related slides here so I can present. And great. So, um, you know, this slide over here, it's comparing a lot of different things. Unfortunately, this is the only one that I could pull up at short notice. Um, but what I would want people to do is focus on a couple of things. So these two colors over here, um, learning dependencies, inferring dependencies, these are just different variants of the snorkel algorithm itself. Um, Oracle over here is the supervised case. So this is if we're using, you know, only ground truth data. So kind of basing off this slide, what we saw was when we wrote labeling functions and applied it to unlabeled data, um, you know, we got a significant improvement in end model performance over just using um, data that had ground truth labels, just because we had access to much more data that we could apply labeling functions to. For other use cases here, you know, for example, this one, we actually had ground truth data for um, what we were using snorkel over. And just for the process, uh, you know, just for uh, the research process, this year when we compared these two, um, if I remember correctly, this is within one F1 point. So this really shows how, you know, this um, method of using heuristics, combining them using the label model is fairly and get you almost the same performance that you would have if you had like manually labeled all the data that had access to. Great, the last question on this Q&A is, is our method one of the ensemble methods? And if not, is it different? A great question. So the way results across a variety of a uh, number of rules being used, you know, for like you can see in this example, you know, we wrote 17 labeling functions for this uh, image based data set. Um, the heart MRI data set that I had shown a couple of slides ago, um, which was also a nature communications publication, that one, we only had five or six rules. 
So it's more of a process on relying on, you know, final evaluation, seeing if you're getting the performance that you expect, and not so much about like exactly how many rules you have um, that kind of determines uh, this process. So I think I've gone through, okay, two more questions on the Q&A. I apologize if I haven't gotten to the questions on the chat. Um, if you want to kind of repeat it on the Q&A since I'm going through that, that would be great as well. So what kind of tasks is su Snorkel suitable for? Can we use it for named entity recognition? Yes, we can use it for named entity recognition and we've actually done that for a couple of use cases. Um, don't have slides for that, unfortunately, but would love to talk about that offline. If you go to snorkel.ai, you'll also see some case studies that we've done um, also just specifically around the NER use case as well. Are labeling functions transferable for different models, i.e. is using a DNN versus linear regression? Would the LFs transfer easily or would they be different? Um, again, great question here. So one way we can do this is the labeling functions, its only role is to training data. You know, what model you uh, use downstream with your training data doesn't really affect your training labels. But what I will say is something that we've seen, especially with Snorkel Flow, the commercial product, is that depending on the model that you're training, you know, you might, different labeling functions might have a different effect on them. So we have kind of a systematic error analysis uh, process along with tools that help the user kind of determine, hey, what model should I be using? You know, depending on the model I'm using, where are the majority of my errors coming from? How can I go back and systematically affect them? So again, happy to talk about details there um, over email or over another call as well. Is the Strong Call pu Pipeline public domain? Um, so the parts that we worked on research, um, the parts that I showed during most of these slides, um, that has been open sourced. You can take a look at snorkel.org to see those. Um, but a lot of the things that I was talking about with you know, NER, with error analysis, this, those are all part of the commercial product and the details there can be found on Snorkel AI. Can I inspect the label model output to inform more accurate label example? If I have 10 noisy heuristics that I hard code into LFs, generate labels, um, can Snorkel then output three more precise labels that are combinations of the original 10? And the use cases, what are the best ways to tag customer support tickets? Um, I'll answer the last part of that question first. Um, again, I definitely encourage you to go check out snorkel.ai, um, especially around customer support tickets. I'm also happy to take questions offline and over email to talk about that use case specifically. In terms of inspecting the label model output and using that to create labeling functions, yes, you can definitely do that. And this is exactly the type of kind of error analysis and iterative process that Snorkel Flow encourages and makes a lot more systematic. So you're not guessing and checking and figuring out what to do. You get very um, you know, immediate sets of suggestions in the uh, platform for you to go back and address these. Great. Um, let me go through the chat now to see if I missed anything. Uh, did you test the accuracy of neural networks that were fed hand labeled versus snorkel data? I believe I answered that and I think that was the increase in accuracy coming from training the ML model on label data versus using noisy rules versus using majority vote. Um, so in this slide here, this independent one, that's majority vote. So, you know, we do see increases across these as well between majority vote and not. Um, this is the one that I wanted to highlight where, you know, if we just compare noisy data to the same amount of hand labeled data, we get within one F1 point, um, you know, and in other cases we were actually beating the hand labeled data uh, uh, baseline that because we could now just assign training labels to a much larger amount of um, data that was previously unlabeled. And I think I've uh, answered most of the questions here. Um, let me know that if I missed anything, just I apologize, but you might have to type it again to the Q&A box. Looks like that's it. Um, again, you know, happy to answer any other questions. Um, I think I'd put my 
email on one of the slides, but it's just my first AI. So Paroma at snorkel.ai. Would love to hear from you. Would love to continue any of the discussions um, that we can get into details over here. Anything from slides about um, snorkel AI as well.